Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank our witnesses as well for putting together uh, this hearing to address our great power competition uh, that we have already engaged in with China. And over the past, as you've heard from many of my colleagues as well, um, we've been expressing the hope that uh, the U.S. will continue to, to make room and accommodate China's rise in the international order. Um, that, of course, as they do that, that their authoritarianism would smooth out and cooperation would increase. But unfortunately, folks, that is not what we have seen happen. Um, the accommodation and the appeasement to China has failed. And the Chinese Communist Party's disruptive efforts haven't softened. And our world is still being subjected to the pressures and threats of a totalitarian regime. Um, their approach to governing has changed very, very little. And the leeway that we've granted them has to change, and it has to change now. Um, the United States as a whole has become far too dependent upon communist China. So we've heard from others about their unlawful incursions in the South China Sea. We've heard about their treatment of the Uyghurs, um, even far reaching outside of uh, China. And we can't ignore this any longer. And so again, I'm just grateful that we are having this discussion today. So um, Mr. Pottinger, if you would please. Um, we have talked about um, our military and diplomatic operations. Uh, what countermeasures can we take through uh, the military and diplomatic operations to, to create challenges for the Chinese approach and disrupt their activities in and out of the gray zone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator. Uh, in addition to some of the ideas uh, that that uh, uh, Bonnie was talking about earlier uh, with relation to the gray zone, I think uh, I, I agree that we need to to do much more with our partners in the region. Uh, we need to accept more risk, uh, and, but also expand areas of cooperation, intelligence sharing, for example, with key partners in the region, Vietnam. <laughs> Uh, with, with the Philippines and Indonesia, in addition to you know, our bedrock uh, partners like Japan and South Korea, uh, increasing our FMM, uh, FMF uh, spending uh, to, to uh, help, help them um, uh, build up some of those standoff capabilities, you know, things like UAVs and helicopters and anti-ship missiles, uh, things of that nature that, that uh, can complicate China's gray zone uh, calculus. Mm -hmm. Now, I appreciate that, and, and I think that's something that we need to have a broader discussion on as well as, as we're looking at um, foreign military sales and, and supports through uh, those types of approaches. But I do think that, uh, as you said, information sharing, very important as well. Uh, there's many things that, that we need to be engaging in uh, to counteract uh, that gray zone activity that we've seen from China. Um, so moving on, of course, during COVID-19 uh, and a number of the, the recent cyber attacks as well, it's just really demonstrating the precarious nature uh, that has been caused by our dependence on uh, China and the global supply and distribution chains. Um, so what do you see as the most critical elements uh, to protecting our domestic critical supply chains and ensuring we're able to meet our needs during that national security crisis um, it, or national security um, requirements in the event of a crisis? Senator, I, th I think one, one good place to start is, is first to recognize that the tariffs that we put in place during the Trump administration on China have actually helped uh, to diversify supply chains, not only for us, but for a lot of our partners. Um, I, I talked to uh, someone who just <laughs> this morning who just returned from the region, uh, visiting several countries, uh, and, and on his travels, he learned that many countries in the region are shifting uh, a lot of their manufacturing out of China uh, because of political risk, uh, because of in part the tariffs that we put in place, and and expanding that footprint in ways that make the supply chain more resilient. So I think recognizing the salutary effect of, of those tariffs is, is an important place to start. I think we should expand our trade with other partners in the region through bilateral 
uh, trade and investment agreements, not multilateral ones, which the American public rightly suspects don't serve their, their interest, as well as was promised, for example, when we brought China into the WTO. But if we do more uh, major bilateral trade agreements with many of our partners out in the Indo-Pacific, um, we have the ability to enforce them better when they're bilateral and, and, and to you know, have terms that, that make it worthwhile, since we are still the, the, uh, the, you know, their, their best market. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and visiting with Southcom um, just recently and Admiral Fowler there, uh, of course, we do see China in our own neighborhood here in the Western uh, Hemisphere. So having those great alliances, those great um, trading partners, it can be very beneficial for everyone to push back upon a nefarious China. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator.